Okay, uh, looks like I'm ready to go. Again, this is Tom Wilder. Uh, welcome to our Occupational Noise Exposure webinar today. Um, good to have everybody. Uh, we've had a, several of you in my webinars uh, yesterday and last week, and I'll be doing another one tomorrow, so uh, welcome again. Uh, most of you know me, but for those of you who don't, I'm Tom Wilder. I've been with the department about seven years. Prior to that, I worked 28 years in various safety training and quality management positions in the textile machine assembly and pharmaceutical industries. Most of those years were in pharmaceutical manufacturing from which I am now retired. So with occupational noise uh, we in pharmaceuticals, we had a hearing conservation program. So from a safety management perspective, I can uh, speak to it highly from that side of the fence. And I may, again, give you, give you some examples from my experience there with this topic. So let's go through our logistics now. If you're in an office, uh, you might want to uh, close your door, uh, turn off your phone. If you're in a cubicle, you might want to use headphones and put up a do not disturb note. And again, we're using Webinato tool today. You'll see the PowerPoint slides on the screen. And I'll, I'll advance those as we work through the class. Now, some of you are using mobile devices like uh, iPads, uh, phones, some of those mobile devices. If you can't see the PowerPoint slide in the center, or, you, uh, or of course, if you can't hear me, then you need to switch to a computer. So um, hopefully you're not having any issues. Uh, some of you are using those devices. There's an emoji there on the bottom left of your screen. I will not be using the emoji. And, but you will be using the chat box for your comments and questions. And you must attend 80% of the course to receive credit. I'll check the times at the end of the webinar. And we can't give credit to anybody that's not registered and logged in. So if you have people sitting around you, only the person that's re registered and logged in will get credit from us. And we process certificates once a month. And you should receive those within three weeks. And if you don't get those, uh, give us a call. And our webinar today is scheduled as normal for one and a half hours. And regardless of the length, you'll get one and a half hours credit because sometimes we don't know how many questions and comments we're going to have. So sometimes we run short. So let's go ahead and begin. And those of you, again, that know me know I like to do instant, instant polls. So let's go ahead and do the two instant polls that I usually do. And let's go ahead and tell me about your experience level with this topic. So what is your experience level with this topic of uh, occupational noise? Uh, so, so it's always good for an instructor to know where, the, where his or her class is with the topic. And as usual, we have several beginners a few intermediate and a, a few advanced folks online uh, with this topic. Now, if you're a beginner with occupational noise, if this is new to you, just be patient because there is a lot to learn. If you've never heard of this topic in your life, you might not understand every little thing I talk about today, but this would be a good beginning for you as well. So. Uh, we have right now 13 beginners, four intermediate, and three advanced. So let's go ahead and stop this poll and close it and ask the other question I always ask. And this one is on your professional safety experience. How many years of professional safety experience do you have? This is always fun for me to look at. Oh, it looks like I have a I have several uh, super experienced people online today. And uh, so we have uh, about eight veterans and uh, a lot of other people are work working toward that status in the class. So again, uh, thanks for responding to the poll. So I'm going to stop this poll and close it and go ahead and introduce this webinar. <coughs> Now, as you know, today's webinar covers occupational noise exposure. And most of you know that noise is unwanted sound. And exposure to high levels of noise can permanently damage our hearing. And of course, 
poor hearing would affect our communication ability to work safely and quality of life. So our efforts to protect hearing should start in the workplace and extend into our daily lives. And please, so please take the time today to learn how we can protect our precious sense of hearing. Now, I also want to make a note uh, before uh, we get going that we have uh, several people online today that are in the construction industry. Now, this is a general industry standard we're covering today. So if you're in the construction industry, you'll find that in your regulation book, 1926.52. And it's a very short standard for construction, but don't be misled by how brief that construction standard is. The noise protection requirement is the same as general industry. And depending on your, your environment, a hearing conservation program may be required. So if you're in construction, uh, you may end up having to put a hearing conservation program together. And for more information, you would go to the general industry standard, which we're covering today. So there are requirements in construction, but uh, the class today is based on general industry. So let's go ahead and get going. Um, our objectives today, uh, as you can see, is to dis distinguish between sound and noise and talk about types of hearing loss, become familiar with uh, noise measuring equipment, and understand the requirements of the OSHA standard. And as you probably already know, that sound is a pressure change detectable by the ear, and the pitch ranges from 20 to 20,000 hertz frequencies. So a lot of you are into music, and if you're like me, you probably bought some audio equipment in your lifetime. You bought re stereo re receivers and speakers, and you would see 20 to 20,000 hertz, and 20 would be your lowest bass tones, and uh, 20,000 would be your highest treble frequencies. And uh, some of these some of these frequencies are even beyond our ability to hear. So uh, that 20 to 20,000 hertz, you've probably seen that before. And normal volume loudness ranges between zero and 140 decibels. That's normal. Now that's not to say that you can't have noise above 140. You could have an instantaneous noise like an explosion uh, that would be above 140. But uh, in a normal workplace, you shouldn't be running into that. So in the standard, we're usually talking about uh, loudness between the range of 0 and 140. Now, noise is unwanted sound. So if you're doing work, it doesn't help you do your work because it carries no information. It's random. And again, it's, if you're calling it noise, it's undesirable. It's just like when you talk about music. Music to one person is noise to somebody else. And music can be noise if it's interfering with your work or causing you to lose hearing. So uh, that's a little bit about noise. And as you can see here in the diagram, uh, your ear is quite complex. Our noise or sound come, is captured by the outer, outer ear and it's conducted down to the middle ear through the three, three bones there to the, um, past the eardrum to the inner ear where you have your uh, sensory, they're like little hair fibers. Uh, they're picking up this information and eventually transmitting it to the brain. So when you have somebody with hearing loss, the hearing loss can be caused by a lot of different reasons. And uh, you could have this for example, this uh, conductive uh, canal there blocked by wax. So you could have earwax causing somebody to have a poor audiogram. So uh, you could have blockage, you could have infection, you can have different things that would affect your hearing results. So like I said, this is just a little simple diagram. And let's go ahead and go to the next slide. And uh, if you have middle ear hearing loss, 
It could be caused by blockage due to wax, or you could have a broken eardrum. But in your, where your um, nerve cells, uh, hair fiber cells pick up hearing in the uh, inner ear, uh, that's, that's what we call uh, inner ear hearing loss. And uh, we do have some hearing loss all our lives. So as we get older, we're losing our hearing, even if it's protected all that time. That's called hearing loss due to aging, and that's called presbycusis. So if an older employee is having a hearing test or hearing exam, uh, the, the, the uh, specialist is doing analysis of the results. They'll do actually an adjustment due to the age of the employee. So um, a lot of times in the past, I've heard simulation uh, tapes or recordings of how much hear hearing we uh, lose as we get older. And that's one thing you'll notice if you go to a um, nursing home or if you have an old grandparent and you go to their house and their TVs turn way up, it's because they've had hearing loss due to aging. And uh, that doesn't even count the occupational hearing loss they could have had or hearing loss from uh, hobbies like uh, firearms or any other uh, going to rock concerts, anything that they could do that could damage their hearing. So that's aging. Of course, loud noises and instantaneous loud noise can, can uh, permanently affect your hearing or a chronic exposure to loud noises over time. And of course, disease can uh, cause hearing loss as well. Now, uh, today, uh, when we talk about occupational hearing loss, we're talking about noise-induced hearing loss. And when people lose their hearing due to the workplace, when their hearing is unprotected, they're going to lose hearing in the higher frequencies so if you're looking at hearing results, again, that's where you're going to start seeing loss there. And, and if you test an employee's hearing, uh, you can have a temporary hearing loss or te temporary shift in their hearing due to some exposure like the day before their hearing test, or they could be sick. But uh, like, for example, if you're a company that has a hearing conservation program, and you're going to do your hearing test on Monday, which I don't think is really a good idea. Uh, you can have people with he temporary hearing loss because the day before they went to a rock concert or they went to a NASCAR race or they're around loud music all weekend, uh, they have a temporary loss that will bounce back after a day or two. So that's a, called a temporary shift. And we'll talk about the shifts course, here in just a couple of seconds. Now, a uh, shift in hearing can also be permanent. It's not uh, due to any uh, temporary uh, source. It's just a permanent hearing loss. And when we look at hearing loss, when we're looking at audiograms, it means that somebody has lost an average of 10 dB hearing in the 2,000, 3,000, and 4,000 hertz ranges. So uh, a lot of you uh, have hearing conservation programs and you go through hearing tests every year and they'll have you go into the booth and put your headphones on and they'll send tones to you. They'll, they'll go beep and you'll either hear it or not. And if it's at a particular frequency, if you don't hear it, what they're going to do is they're going to amplify that tone 5 dB and then they'll go beep. And if you hear it, that records, you'll signal that you heard the, the tone, and that will go on the uh, audiogram. But what they'll do is they'll take that same frequency tone and make it louder and louder and louder until you finally hear it. And that's how we measure hearing loss at a particular tone. Now, when we do, when we do have noise, most of us know that it affects our cardiovascular system. It could increase our heart rate, our blood pressure. It affects our nervous system. And of course, interferes with speech and concentration. Um, 
can, now I'm going to give you a chance to type right now. If you're in a workplace that's noisy, uh, what's a rule of thumb that your noise level in a work area is too high? Now, I'm, you don't have any uh, noise measurement equipment. You don't have any equipment with you. What's a rule of thumb in the workplace that is too noisy? There's probably not going to be any wrong answer here. So go ahead and type to me. What would be any? Okay, discomfort. Right, that's a great answer. Can't hear a whisper. Ringing in the ears. Yeah, that would be a terrible, that would be a bad sign. Shouting. Dizzy. Tinnitus is again ringing in the ears. Raising voice to have a conversation. If you have to talk loud to communicate. Now, what distance are we talking about communicating to somebody if you have to raise your voice? About what distance between the people? It does, you don't have to give me inches. Arm's length, Will. That's exactly what I'm looking for, Herb. Those are all good answers. Two, three, three feet, arm's length. So if you're both walking through a work area and somebody's having to raise their voice, that's a red flag that we may have noise that's, you know, could be dangerous to an employee's hearing over time or instantaneous. Now, um, it's annoying. It can cause pain, stress, and fatigue. It, it can reduce your work efficiency or lower morale. I know, um, for example, this morning, uh, I start really early here in downtown Raleigh. We're in a, a big office-type building. And uh, the, the Raleigh, city of Raleigh workers are out on the streets uh, moving leaves. And they're out there using leaf blowers. And I'm inside a building. And you can still t tell that they're loud. We can hear those leaf blowers outside. And I'm, and I'm not overexposed to noise inside the building from that. But we can hear them out there. So I would expect those workers out there to have hearing protection on because those those gasoline leaf bores have, are pretty loud. And uh, it's kind of annoying to me, but, you know, I just have to deal with it <laughs> and while the leaves are, while they're getting leaves up this time of year outside. Okay, now, uh, if you have a workplace and you think there may be issues with noise, uh, you need to... Uh, have some due diligence there to make sure you don't have an issue. Now, uh, we have pictures here. There, uh, Some of these pieces of equipment are old or kind of antiques. These are not necessarily the most modern pictures. But um, uh, you would have a safety professional go around and take some sound level readings. So they'll take a sound level meter like what we have on the top right. And they'll go around and take some readings. Now, what kind of readings are going to get the um, safety professional's attention if they're taking sound readings? What are they looking at? What levels? What are some red flags? Go ahead and type in some answers there. and Let's see what you think. 85, greater than 85. Okay, over 70. Over 70 is not going to be a problem, but 85 is the action level for an average, time-weighted average for an entire day. So if you're getting anything eight, above 85, then uh, I would go ahead and, and start thinking about doing some other things. So you're getting some levels that are above 85. Now, um, now let's just say, let's just say I gave that example of this morning. Let's just say uh, I left our building and I went outside and I saw one of those workers over there with one of those gasoline-powered uh, leaf blowers. Uh, what level per OSHA is that person, and I'm going to use the word required, required to wear hearing protection? Well, how loud does that leaf blower? 90. That is correct. That is the requirement. If it's 90 decibels, 
if you're in construction, if you work for a city, you work for a company, if you got 90 or above for an instant or for an average all day, you better have some hearing protection on. Now, when I was in the industry, we were stricter than the OSHA requirement. We said that we require the employees to wear hearing protection at 85 or above. And we're going to talk about the difference between, of course, 85 and 90 in a few minutes. But if you're using equipment that's putting out 90 or above, they are required to wear hearing protection. Now, um, do, do the employees that are required to wear hearing protection need to be trained on how to wear that hearing protection? Do they need to be trained? Yes, of course. Um, now, unfortunately, there are companies out there that may not be training their employees how to wear hearing protection, and they'll give those foam uh, plugs, foam earplugs to their employees, and they just hand them to them. They say, there's your hearing protection. And if the employee just shoves it into their ear, it's probably not going to seal, and it's probably not going to protect their hearing uh, properly. If they won't have it in far enough. They would not have put it in correctly. Now, if you have standard foam ear protectors, they look like a little little tiny cylinder. What what do you have to do to that foam to put it in correctly? Go ahead and tell me. Roll it. That's right. Roll it. Now, to me, of all those answers, roll it is the best answer. You're going to take uh, your index finger and then the finger beside it and your, your thumb, and you're going to roll it until it becomes small. And then you're going to reach across to the opposing ear and pull on it to open that canal. And I'm going to put that in there and hold it and let it expand to seal that seal so it protects. And like Elizabeth says, roll and insert into the ear and let it expand. Now that's just your foam plug. Now they're ribbed ones. You have uh, hearing muffs. There are lots of different types of devices to protect your hearing. So you're going to roll it. Okay, Herb says many of the boxes have a test hole on the box to train your staff. Okay, yeah. So make sure people are trained. I know that you may have gone on a plant tour for some manufacturing plant sometime. You were like a, a visitor and they were running production. And they, they would give people earplugs and not tell them how to put them in. <laughs> so anyway, make sure people know. So now if you've got readings of 85 or above and you're a safety professional, you're thinking uh, we may have a, a requirement to wear hearing protection if it ever goes above 90. And we may have exposures that average 85 decibels for the day. So how am I going to know that? Well, I'm going to take a noise dosimeter there on the bottom and I'm going to I'm going to hang that on an employee for eight hours, and the little microphone is going to be clipped, you know, near near their head, you know, maybe on their lapel. They're going to wear that all day long, and uh, we're going to see what kind of results we get. Now, if we got 85 decibels average or greater, that's going to say, per OSHA, you're going to have to have a hearing conservation program. So a lot of these things I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, uh, you're going to have to do. So 85 average or greater, you're going to have to have a hearing conservation program. Now, these two devices that are on this slide, what do you always have to do before you use it? Any of them. Calibrate. So you're going to, and actually, Actually, what it is, it's a calibration check. So when I was in the industry and I was using a noise dosimeter, I had a standard calibrator, uh, or actually a standard calibration device that put out a tone. And that device had to be sent off every year for its calibration. But it put out a tone. And when I connected it to my dosimeter, the tone that it's supposed to put out, it's got to uh, exactly 
uh, match the reading that's on the screen of the device. And um, if it's not exactly the same, then I'm going to have to fine tune that reading to match my standard. So you're going to have to do a calibration check. Now, uh, is there, now nowadays, is there something else that you can use to measure noise besides these fancy devices? What else can you use? Yeah, Spencer and Herb. Yep, there are lots of apps out there. And NIOSH has one, and I've got, I've got that very app on my phone. It's called NIOSH Sound Level Meter. And I really love that application. So if you're a safety person, you're walking around, you can you could take some readings, but I want to warn you that you can't use that for official reports. So if you're doing uh, sound level uh, readings that you're going to record in a, in a log or an industrial hygiene log, you can't use your phone because your, your sound level meter on your phone hasn't gone through any calibration check. But it's a great tool. Uh, you can use it. And um, I will tell you that it's extremely accurate. But we can't legally use it for sound level meter readings um, because, because it's not been calibrated. Candace is, uh, I'll go ahead and type it in. NIOSH sound level meter. NIOSH. Now, National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, they're a uh, part of the Center for Disease Control, CDC, and they're the people that do research for OSHA, NIOSH. So it's a government agency. You're welcome. And um, it's a great tool. I love it. It's highly accurate. It's just we can't use our phone for that reason. So if you're a safety professional, you're going to have to buy some equipment that's uh, are calibrated against a known standard. Okay. Now, if you're doing some uh, investigation, if you've got a noisy piece of equipment and you're trying to dampen the noise or trying to make some changes to, to lower the noise level and focus on different frequencies, uh, you could have an octave band analyzer. And what it will do, it will, it will tell you within the frequencies what the problem frequency is. It could be a high frequency or a low. And the picture here, this one's an ant. I'll call this one an antique because we, uh, here with the state, we have some new ones that would, that technology-wise would put this one to shame. But uh, you'll need to use an octave band analyzer. Now, you're not required to have that tool, but it's a diagnostic tool. I just thought I'd mention now, you're not required to have that tool, but it's a diagnostic tool. I just thought I'd mention it. Now, how much noise can you expose your employee to? What loudness or what levels? Now, the permissible exposure limit for average for a whole day is uh, 90 decibels as far as requiring protection. But 85 decibels is going to require you to have a hearing conservation program. And if you ever have an OSHA compliance officer or a health compliance officer come in um, and you have a hearing conservation program, you need to prove to them that you've done everything you can to engineer the, the noise level to a lower loudness to a lower level, to eliminate it, or rotate people. Do something to keep them from being overexposed. So uh, PPE, personal protective equipment, is our last resort. But uh, we do want you to make an effort to eliminate, box that noise in, lower it somehow, so that we don't have to depend on people wearing personal protective equipment. Now, uh, we're going to look at table G16 here. And this is a very important table for you to understand. And I've got some high level people online and this is not new to you for sure. So the requirement for a hearing protection, if you have somebody exposed eight hours a day to average of 90 decibels. 
but this is the most important uh, point I want to make here. If you look down to 110 decibels, if you expose somebody for 15 minutes or a quarter, uh, well actually, that's actually a half hour. If you expose somebody a half hour to 110 decibels, that's equivalent to 85 decibels. So if you put a sound level meter on somebody and they're in quiet areas all day long and they got 30 minutes of 110, you, you're you going to have to have a hearing conservation program and protect their hearing. And 115 is 15 minutes or less. Now I'm going to give you an example for this one. When I was in pharmaceuticals, one plant I worked in one time made antibiotics. And the active ingredient, we had to put it through a something to change the particle size. We put it through a micro pulverizer. And when that machine was running empty, it was 115 decibels. That, that uh, piece of equipment is screaming. And uh, because of that, of course, we had to do everything we could to lower the level. And of course, we had to have hearing protection. We had to do a lot of things because we had some equipment it was extremely noisy, a micro pulverizer. If you work in a pharmaceutical plant and you have a tablet press that makes tablets, you're talking about 90 decibels. So um, in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, there's some loud equipment there. And the, the areas where they make product have solid, cleanable walls and floors. So the, the noise just bounces around in the rooms. There's no carpet. There's no upholstered furniture. It's just stainless steel and hard, hard surfaces everywhere. So it, it does uh, amplify the noise. So um, if you have power equipment in your workplace, if you have drills, blowers, um, uh, some of that power equipment, chainsaws, those sorts of things, uh, you're getting into some pretty high levels of noise. Um, so again, it depends on what kind of equipment and processes you have in your workplace. Okay, now the action level for the OSHA standard is 85 decibels average for the day. So you do your readings, you put a noise, you put a, a dosimeter on an employee, you've got a, a reading of 85 average for the day or more. You're going to have your company or employer is going to have to have, to have to have a hearing conservation program for that, um, that that workplace. So 85 is the trigger, it's the action level. And like the slide says, you've got to have a hearing conservation program. And uh, you have to have a monitoring program. So that's going to buy you into a hearing conservation program. And um, then, uh, hopefully by then, you've done some monitoring. Uh, you've taken uh, people that work in noisy areas. We, you've done uh, monitoring of their dose. And you've taken people that go into different places and monitor their results. Because you have may have maintenance people that go into a machine shop. They'll go into a boiler room. They'll go into a room with air compressors. They'll go in and out of loud areas all day. We want to know what their average level is as well, because they're not in the same place all day, but you may have your maintenance people in the hearing conservation program, as well as your production people that work in a production area. You want your sampling to be representative for different jobs, all shifts, and when things change, rooms and processes change, you need to repeat the monitoring. Now, uh, this says hearing protectors are inadequate. Now, if you do your homework and do everything right and people wear it right, you shouldn't find hearing protectors being inadequate. But they could be worn incorrectly. That would make it inadequate because it's not put in correctly. Now, let me go ahead and stop right now and see if you have any questions or comments or see if you're good to go. 
We're going to stop here for a second. How's everybody doing? All right. Everybody's good. So let's keep moving. All right. And good, I see everybody's still awake because you I don't think you could type if you were asleep. Now, um, if you do monitoring of an employee and you do some industrial hygiene work, uh, you're going to put a calibrated uh, noise dosimeter on the employee. They're going to wear it all day. And um, they're going to wear it all day. And then the results are going to be recorded into official form or an uh, industrial hygiene logbook. You're going to record those readings. And anytime you do monitoring of your employee, if you're monitoring uh, air, if you're hanging an air sampling pump on them, or you're monitoring them from noise, always give them their results. Don't do any safety monitoring of your people without giving them a document that says we monitoring, monitored your noise exposure and here are your results. When I was in the industry, um, that's what I had to do. It was required. Okay. Now, uh, Spencer, that is Corey and Robert. <laughs> so sometimes we, we have to use our own employees as models for, uh, for, these, for these slides. So they're, they're, we're pretending that uh, Corey is letting Robert know about his results of his uh, dosimetry. Now, um, you're going to have a testing program when you exceed the 85 action level. And when you have your hearing test done, you're going to have a qualified person, but you're going to have to have an audiologist or somebody of similar qualifications interpret those results. Now, some of you may work somewhere where you have your own uh, booth where you test noise. You have a booth right there on site, and you've got a qualified person to do the test. Or you may have a mobile unit coming in once a year. They will test six or eight people at a time. So um, the, the audiometer, the test equipment has to be checked before it's used and calibrated uh, annually. And of course, they have to keep records of that. Now, this testing of the employees is not going to cost the employee any money. So if you hire an employee and they work and you have a hearing conservation program and they, they come in to work, you've got six months to test them. Now, what you're going to do when, they, when you hire them, you're going to uh, give them hearing protection devices and train them on how to wear them. And they say, wear these and we're going to get your baseline within the first six months. We're going to give you your first hearing test. Now, if you're having a mobile test fan come in, you have up to a year to get their baseline done. But in any case, you're going to give them hearing protection because you don't want them to work there and lose hearing before they even have their baseline. So um, you're going to protect their hearing. And you're going to do the hearing testing annually. Now, uh, so if you've got a hearing, cap hearing uh, conservation program, and all your employees in your facility are checked on January 30th this year. Uh, when a year rolls by, within that 365 days, you're expected to do their next hearing test. So annually does not mean calendar year. Annually means elapsed time. We're talking about 365 days because they have to have an annual audiogram now, when that audiologist, can even talk, audiologist interprets those results, they're going to make some adjustments for aging. So if you have some older employees, their initial test results, they'll, they will adjust those for aging. So there is a correction for aging. And if any of your um, employees have a hearing loss that's a standard threshold shift, STS, you have to let them know. You're going to let them know, and you're going to give them a document to let them know in writing. 
Okay, like this slide says, this is an example of an audiogram. And this is the left and the right ear. So I'm going to take my highlighter and the X is the left ear, X, and the Y is the right ear. Okay, they come in and they have their hearing checked. And this employee, when they're hired, they have pretty good hearing. And I'm looking at that and I'm going, congratulations, you have good hearing. Uh, you've done a good job protecting your hearing so far in your life because you're, you've got good results. Now, um, this the zero point is, that's audiometric zero. Audiometric zero is kind of like telling somebody they have 20-20 vision. Uh, that's called, it's like perfect hearing. But one thing you'll notice is this person in his or her right ear at 250 hertz had better than zero. So that, uh, they can make that tone less loud and they could still hear it. So it's like with vision, you can have people with better than normal vision or better than normal hearing to begin with. Okay, Elizabeth has a question. Who does hearing tests for temporary employees? Is it the agency or the company? All right. Now the company where the okay the company where the temporary employee works is responsible to have a hearing conservation program. They're they're responsible for having it done. So the, the company that brings the temps in, they can't throw that responsibility away. But they have to assure that hearing, hearing testing is done of all people in their facility doing particular jobs or working in different areas. Now, um, who does the test? The company has to require that the test is done. But... Um, uh, who hires them or whatever, you, they could have a, a, a arrangement with the agency to pay for it or have the agency bring the, the people in to do the test. But the bottom line responsibility falls on the employer. So uh, the people that do the test have to be qualified. The hiring, the ultimate employer that has the site where the temps work, they're responsible to have a program and the temp employees uh, fall into it. But um, I worked in a, uh, an assembly plant before I came here with the state. Uh, we did a machine assembly. We had two production lines. We had regular and temporary workers. And uh, everybody went through the same hearing test every year. It was done by the same company the parent company or the host company paid for everything. And the, the temp employees had to go through the same things regular employees did. So uh, the company has to determine who does the test. So um, I would say it would be kind of unusual for the temp agency to handle all that. I would use usually the, the parent, the company. You're welcome. And hopefully that clarified it a little bit. If it didn't, just give me a call later. Now, okay, this audiogram, we talked about that person being hired. And then one year later, we go, wow, and I'll get to your uh, question here in a second, Michael. Um, look at this. After one, one year, look at this. At 4,000 hertz, uh, that person had a significant loss at that at that frequency. They had to amplify that tone quite a bit after one year to get that person to hear it. So um, this person in both ears has had quite a loss there. So um, something's wrong here. I'm, I'm thinking their hearing protection is not being worn. 
uh, not wearing it correctly, something's wrong because to me that would be alarming. Now, uh, Pat's got a great answer. If you have a test like this, uh, you have you know 30 days to do a retest and go ahead and do a retest because that person may be sick, they may have a cold, they may have earwax, they have, may have gone to a rock concert the day before, a NASCAR race. So uh, anytime you have something like this, or if you have a shift, uh, always do a retest because it could be a temporary hearing loss. Thanks, Pat, that's a great answer. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So a standard shift is uh, they have a 10 dB loss at 2,000, 3,000, and 4,000 hertz. And that is close to your uh, speaking conversation frequencies. That's why OSHA focuses on those frequencies. And like Pat said, uh, the employer may retest within 30 days. But either way, you got to let the employee know what the results are. And so you're going to have to do an investigation there. And that employee has to have the results in writing within actually 21 days. It's actually 21 days. I said about a month, but it's really within 21 days. Now let's look at another audiogram. Now this is kind of like ideal world here. You hire an employee, and this this is just this is just in one ear. We're not, we're not looking at both ears. This is just one, one ear. So you hire an employee. They come in and zero, zero, zero across the line. Uh, they, these frequencies did not have to be amplified to get those employees, that employee to hear that tone. Now, um, year one is the red line. Year two is the green line. So um, year one, let's go back to year one. Year one, they lost 5 dB here, 15 here, and 25 there. So 5 and 15 is 20, uh, and 25, that's, wait a minute, 25, this is so small, it's hard for me to even read. Uh, 20, yeah, 20, there, there's an average of 15 dB loss there in year one. Now, is that is that a shift? Is that a shift? Yes, it's a shift. And Michael, I'm, I'm, I'm going to come back and answer your question. I'm not forgetting about you. That is a shift. That after a year one, is that recordable on an OSHA 300 log? Let's say, let's say they retest and you still got it. Okay, you're gonna, you're gonna re, you're, you're retesting. You're getting that same result. Is that recordable on OSHA 300 log after year one? Now, this is where you're going to learn something today, and a lot of you may not understand this. That is not recordable. You have to have a shift in hearing and a, Becky, you're right, uh, and a permanent hearing loss. You have to have both to be recordable on your OSHA log. So if you're recording a simple straight standard threshold shifts on your log, uh, that doesn't have to be on there. Now, you have to do some things, but that doesn't have to go on your OSHA 300 log. Now, let's take this further. Year two, they have it. There's another shift. There's another shift. They've lost another five. They lost 25. There's an average 10 dB loss from the previous results. So there's definitely a shift. But... Here's the main point. Permanent hearing losses are measured against audiometric zero, regardless of how good that employee's hearing was to begin with. 
So hearing loss, uh, coming in with bad hearing uh, works against the employee because permanent hearing losses are measured against audiometric zero. So let's look at the numbers. Year two is five away from audiometric zero, 20 away from audiometric zero, and 50 away from audiometric zero. 50 plus 20 plus five is an average of 25 dB. That is a permanent hearing loss. That, you have to have a shift and a permanent hearing loss to make it recordable. So year two in that ear, if those results stand, that's going to be a permanent hearing loss that is recordable. Now, let's go back. Let's go back to the question. Yeah. Ashley, I said that wow a few years ago. It was like you, wow. <laughs> I learned something new then too. Uh, now, let's go back. Michael had the question. If the plant noise level is isolated to certain areas of the plant, do all employees have to have it? No. No. You're gonna you're gonna you're gonna measure your employee's exposure to now let's say let's say you have a room in a plant that's very noisy. Uh, let's say it's a boiler room. It has two boilers in there. It's very very loud. A boiler room. You have people that let's say you have somebody that works in a boiler room all day long, and their their average exposure is 85 or greater then you're going to have to have a hearing conservation program for that employee. Now, if maintenance people go in there and they go everywhere else, uh, if there is 85 or greater, they're going to have to be in the program. But if you have people that never go in there or never trigger any thresholds for noise at all, as far as length of exposure or dosimetry, all your employees do not have to go through a hearing conservation program. So uh, when I was in a manufacturing plant, uh, when we made pharmaceuticals, uh, tablets, uh, antibiotics, um, our manufacturing and our packaging people and our maintenance staff were the only, only employees that had to be in the hearing conservation program. Were the only, only employees that had to be in the hearing conservation program. All the rest of the people that were in the plant didn't have to be, and that doesn't mean they didn't walk through those areas, but they were the only people that had exposures that triggered a hearing conservation program. Okay. All right, let me get caught up here. Okay, how can you, Elizabeth says, how can you avoid listing and spend the threshold shift as a recordable? How do you avoid? How do you avoid it? Well, I mean, the only way to avoid it is to protect people's hearing. And, and you know, if they if they're going to have a shift and a permanent hearing loss, if those are the facts, there's at that point there's no way to prevent it. So again, you're going to avoid it, prevent it. All right, now let's keep going. Now, if you have, okay, I'll look, look at Becky's comment. Okay, Becky says, so if they're in there for 15 minutes twice a day and the level is 115, then they would be part of the hearing conservation program. Yes. Yes, Becky. But uh, those people that are like that, you need to go ahead and put dosimeters on there to get your official exposure. But per the chart, you're right. If you had an area that, that had a piece of equipment that was in there screaming all day long, it wouldn't take very long to have an average exposure of 85 decibels. Okay, so if you have a shift and, it, and it's been verified, uh, uh, you're going to require that employee to wear hearing protection at 85 or above decibels. Now, regular employees per OSHA have to be protected at 90 or above required. But if someone has a shift, their requirement is going to start at 85. And uh, shall be retrofitted and be trained. 
shall be referred for an exam if necessary and appropriate. Okay. Now, hair protectors. Now, uh, personal protective equipment, there are two types of personal protective equipment that require a variety of equipment. One is hearing protection. So if you're a company that has a hearing conservation program, you have to offer your employees more than one type of hearing protection, a variety. So just, just remember that. You can't just say, we have a hearing conservation program and here's the one thing that we have for you and you can't use anything else and we don't have anything else to give you. You have to offer variety. That little tiny picture down there shows a, a variety of plug type devices. And you might have muffs and plugs, but you need to have a variety. And the variety is also required for respirators. Now, we're not talking about respirators today. Hearing protectors. They have to wear it above 90 decibels at any point in time. Now, uh, if they're exposed above 85, if they've had a shift, they're required to wear it. Or people that haven't been tested yet, they're required to wear it above 85. But when I worked for companies, most of them were stricter than the OSHA standard. We required everybody to wear hearing protection above 85. Because the OSHA standard, um, if I had to rewrite it, I would require everybody to wear it at 85 no matter what. I mean, I wouldn't want people to come in and until they lost hearing, start requiring them at 85. I'm just going to go ahead and head it off. I'm going to require at 85. Okay. They're not going to cost the employee any money. A variety of protector types. You'll find that right in the standard. Make sure it fits and seals and replaced as necessary. And boy, uh, I worked one place that had disposable hearing protection, kind of like those plugs. And there was like a little vending machine, like a little vending unit. They didn't have to pay for them, but a little dispenser. And people come in every day and they get a couple of plugs. They come in from lunch, they get a couple of plugs. Next thing you know, over a long period of time, you would see those plugs everywhere. You could see them outside. You could see them all over the place. So um, these, these sample plugs, sometimes you can pay a little bit more for them. And like, I like the ones that have the cords on them. And they can be cleaned and washed and reworn. So uh, some of these, again, uh, you don't have to throw them away every single time. You can wear them for several days. And it cut down a lot of the trash and litter on your site and also protect their hearing. Some people medically can't wear plugs because of some medical reason. So you might need to give them muffs here are earmuffs instead. Now, uh, you're going to, when you give them hearing protection, it's got to protect their noise exposure down below 90 decibels. Now, this is the employees that haven't lost any hearing. You got to bring the, the noise levels down below 90, their exposure with these plugs. So, uh, these plugs and muffs that you buy, they have noise reduction rating, NRR. Now, the EPA is the one that sets the NRR, and they're the ones that get into the ratings of these plugs and muffs. Let's say, um, let's say you're, you're giving somebody muffs, and they're rated at 29 NRR, 29 no, noise reduction rating. Now, what OSHA says in the standard and we'll get to this again in a minute, uh, you have to subtract seven from that number because that's a laboratory number, the 29. So you're going to subtract seven. So that's going to give you 22. And let's say their noise exposure is 100 without protection. When you subtract 22 from that, you're going to get 78. So when they wear that muff, they're, they're supposedly uh, protecting themselves down to 78, which is well below 90. Now, if the employee had a shift before, you had to bring it that number down below 85. So
So uh, in any time you have noise exposures increasing, you're going to have to reevaluate the situation. Now, let's take this a little bit further. That's the minimum OSHA requirement. Subtract 7 from the rating. Take that number and subtract it from their average exposure and make sure they're below 90 for people that don't have shifts and below 85. Now, NIOSH, NIOSH, who does research for OSHA and part of CDC, NIOSH has a recommendation. Now, uh, OSHA doesn't enforce recommendations. They, they enforce requirements from the standards. But what NIOSH wants you to do, NIOSH says, subtract your seven like OSHA says, and then divide that by two. So your 29 minus seven divided by two is 11. So are you, are you a company or employer that likes to use NIOSH recommendations? OSHA is not going to require that. But if you're trying to be in line with NIOSH, it's going to be stricter than OSHA. But you're going to have to at least follow the OSHA standard. Now, if that's confusing to you, I'm sorry. If you're new to hearing conservation, this may sound like Chinese to you. But um, a lot of companies uh, run their programs off of best practices and off NIOSH recommendations. So you may find that you're exceeding the OSHA requirements quite a bit. Okay, so we talked about the noise reduction rating. You're going to find that on the package of the product that you buy. And uh, OSHA is going to have you take your average exposure and subtract 7 from that to see what your estimated exposure is for your employee. Now, training. If you have a hearing conservation program, you have to have annual training. And that means every 365 days, they better have training. And this is not just on calendar years. And this, these are the things you have to cover in training. How does noise affect their hearing? Why do they wear hearing protectors? And how do you wear the hearing protectors, take care of them, keep them clean, or maybe they throw them away each time, whatever. And tell them about the testing they take every year and what the results mean. So that's your uh, training. Now I will tell you, when I was in the industry, a long time ago, um, I, I brought people into a room for training. And what I did, just to help sell the safety topic, I brought my stereo receiver from home to work. I brought this high-powered receiver that I got right after I was out of college. It was a big thing back then, and I had gigantic speakers. I brought this receiver to work and said, hey, we're going to have a training class. This required every year. I'm going to cover everything that OSHA requires and uh, tell you everything you need to know about protecting your hearing. So what I did in the training class, I gave the employee in the back of the room a calibrated sound level meter. And I had my stereo receiver up front. And I, t I turned it on to a radio station that was playing music. And then I, I told the person in the back of the room, I said, let me know when I hit 85 decibels. So I kept increasing the loudness, making it louder and louder and louder. And then they finally gave me the sign. Hey, we're at 85 decibels. And they could not believe how loud that was. And I said, okay, let's go ahead and stop the test. We turned all that off. And we have people from the next room coming over and saying, what are y'all doing in there? I said, we're doing training. And I, and I said, this 85 decibels is the average exposure of packaging line number one. A lot of you work on packaging line one. They say, well, it doesn't seem that loud out there. I said, well, I said, well you're wearing, well, first of all, you're wearing hearing protection out there. And I said, this is the loudness of line one. And they were very impressed because 85 is just where it begins. We had equipment, as, as I've told you before, that was much louder than that. Okay, that's training. Uh, you, you're expected to put, make the standard available for people to see it, post it. 
um, like I said, we had a bulletin board, a main bulletin board where we posted things, and we had the uh, hearing conservation standard posted there for anybody that wanted to read it. Uh, we made the requirements very clear to everybody. Now, I don't know that we had too many people stopping at the board to read that, but this is what the OSHA standard tells me to do. So that's what we did. Now, we have to keep records when we have a hearing conservation program. Uh, we, need, we need to have, give them access to their results. And let's say, let's say your company was bought out by another company you make the same product, you do everything the same except you have a different owner. All those records are transferred. We're going to keep at least two years of noise records. Now in our company, we had a numbered log, but we kept ours in, but you're going to have to keep those records. And the audiometric tr test, you're going to give, uh, keep results for the employment duration of the employee. And you're going to have the information that you see there, name, job classification, calibration date, all that information that's on the slide is going to have to be on the record. And uh, there are other paragraphs in the standard that, that go into it for other exemptions, observation and monitoring, test requirements, and lots of appendices, lots of reference material in there. So if you're running a program, uh, look at your references. So we have talked about sound and noise and different types of hearing loss, and we've become familiar with equipment and the requirements of the standard. So with that said, right now at 11.07, I'm going to call this the official end of the webinar, and I'm going to go ahead and stay on a few more minutes. So thank you for attending today. Uh, we enjoyed your participation today. If anybody has any final questions, I will stay, stand by for your questions. You're welcome. Uh, let me scroll back. Okay, I've, I've already seen that question. All right. It looks like we're pretty good right now, but again, um, remember what we said about recording of a hearing loss. It has to be a permanent hearing loss. Remember what you need to do with shifts and calibration of your equipment and everything you need to do. Uh, you have a Merry Christmas too, Spencer. Thank you, Lynn and Avanda. Everybody's been great today. Thanks, Jeffrey. Good answers from everybody. I had a lot of experts out there I could tell. Elizabeth, Jessica, Brenda, again, thanks to everybody. Uh, so it looks like, thanks, Marty, uh, for being here. Thomas. Don, Jeffrey, and Marty's one of our regulars. Michael, thank you, Ashley. So, again, it looks like I'm not going to get any additional questions. Oh, we do have a question. Yes, yeah, I'm going to be giving the presentation tomorrow. So, tomorrow is going to be confined space entry for general industry. Ashley, thanks. Don. So some of you, I will see you tomorrow on tomorrow's webinar. But for the rest of you, thanks again, and all of you have a great day, and I will see you later. Bye-bye.